Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. This is hi. <laughs> this is the second time we've done a, a joint Zoom and in-person presentation. So we hope you forgive us if we have any technical issues along the way. Uh, I'm Melanie McWhorter, uh, the Deputy Director here at Historic Santa Fe Foundation, and you're here for the Scott Andrews talk. So if you're here for the Lebowski wedding, you can go out the other door. I watch The Office way too much. Um, uh, so, um, and we're here uh, currently in the space of Historic Santa Fe Foundation on Canyon Road, 545 Canyon Road, and we are open from Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 p.m. The garden is currently closed. As you may hear in the recording, and some of you hear live, you hear the tapping of the stonemason outside. They are currently working on our Sakia interpretation space. Beautiful, beautiful stone work that they're doing out there. So if you have a chance, you guys, if you can come by, or you guys, after this, you're welcome to go take a look at that, at the work they're doing out there. Um, and we are, as you see right now, we have Michelle, I'm sorry, um, excuse me, Marie Shields' work. She's one of our artists who lives in the compound. Um, this is work about the practice of being a writer. So she's actually doing a book on that's for writers to kind of teach them a little bit about how to. So this is up actually through, I think, um, Thursday. No, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow's the last day. And Marie will be here at 1.30 p.m. tomorrow if you'd like to meet her or speak with her about the work. And then after that, we will have um, an in-person exhibition opening this coming Friday with um, Aaron Payne. He is doing a work of African-American artists. It's called How I See It, African-American Abstraction, 1960 to 1980. And he curated the show. It'll be an amazing show with some works from his collection and other works on consignment. And the July exhibition is our resident, who's actually in the back of the room, for you, those of you who are here, um, Julia Dickinson, who creates brooms, large and small. And the exhibition will be called Broom Room. So if you join us for that, it's the first, uh, first Friday in July. We usually do them the first Friday through the last Friday of the month, with the exception of this upcoming one with Aaron Payne. Our next salon talk is at the 2022 Members Meeting and Garden Party, which is on June 23rd at 5 p.m. in our garden space. Weather permitting, heaven, you know, heaven provide us with some rain. That would be wonderful if we had to do it in here, but we usually have it in the garden. Um, we will have the talk about the Esequia with Mayor Domo B.C. Rambo of Esequia de la Mariah. He will be the speaker and he'll talk about the interpretation. That's the first step in our interpretation plan for this whole building. We also have the capital campaign brochure out in the front if anybody wants to see it. And it's on our website as well. If you want to find out what we're up to here at the foundation. And it's historicsantafe.org is the website. And um, for more events, you can also go to Historic Santa Fe. It's recording. Hi, if we lost you there for just a second. <laughs> so um, post your questions, and I hope we won't have another cutoff. Post your questions in the chat box or in the Q&A. &Q um, and then Scott will speak. And when it, we start the video for the in-person, uh, we'll actually start it here on the computer as well. So there'll be two different coinciding presentations of the video. And you guys what may have to turn up your sound a little bit for the audio. Um, if you have any issues with that, please send us a message in the chat box and we'll try and take care of that as soon as possible. So now we'll talk about the talk. Um, since 2014, the Wisdom Archive has been producing video portraits of masters of traditional culture for a YouTube archive. 
primarily focusing on the work of Northern New Mexico elders, the archive now includes 51 short films, ranging from the traditional music of uh, Antonio Apadapa, Antonia Apadaca and Sapriano, is that correct? Cipriano. Cipriano. Cipriano, excuse me, should practice a little more carefully, um, to year in the life depictions of lifetime sheep herders and farmers. Portraits of traditional artists at work and ancient recipes brought to life. The archive's intent is to celebrate and preserve disappearing traditional culture. Learn more about it at um, thewisdomarchive.com. And there's also the page on our website too, which will have this link if anybody loses that, you can find that on our, on our site. So about the speaker. And I'll be right back. I, well, I forgot the cheat sheet. That's okay. You got you got a couple you got a couple paragraphs I can read through right here. I'll go slowly instead of like I normally do, really, really, really quickly. Um, Scott Andrews first came to Santa Fe in 1978 as a student at the Anthropo Anthropology Film Center on Upper Canyon Road. It was the second year of a master's degree in visual anthropology and launched him on a career producing cross-cultural documentaries for public television around the world. After gaining a PhD doctor um, in education at Stanford, he went on to win an Emmy for his work in Afghanistan, Last Images of War, and a DuPont Silver Baton for a three-part frontline series about integration at Berkeley High School Colors. He returned to live in Santa Fe in 2013 and began filming with local traditional masters at the Wisdom Archive. So Historic Santa Fe Foundation is pleased to have um, Dr. Scott Andrews <laughs> in his project, the Wisdom Archive, preserving and celebrating the traditions of New Mexico. And if you help me, now we can do it. We can all clap now. <laughs> so how many of Thank you, Melanie, and thank you, Historic Santa Fe, for having me, having the Wisdom Archive here. Um, she she kind of gave you the, the history, but basically in 78, 79, I came here to go to film school at Upper Canyon uh, at the Anthropology Film Center, which at the time had a master's program with Temple University in Philadelphia. So you went to do graduate anthropology work in Philly for one year, and then you came and learned 16 millimeter film production on Upper Canyon Road, 1628 Upper Canyon. Uh, so I was there for a year. And while I was there, I thought, oh my God, there's so much incredible uh, traditional culture still happening in New Mexico. I wish that I could film with some of the elders to preserve it. Well, at the time, 16 millimeter for one 12 minute reel, by the time you paid for the film, paid for the uh, development paid to have your audio and your uh, your uh, film sync you're looking at a thousand dollars for for uh, 12 minutes and that's not even including the camera which is twenty five thousand dollars so at that time i just couldn't afford to do it and the equipment didn't exist to do it any other way so i went off i made films and then my wife beatrice and i came back here we moved here in 2013 and we happened to buy the house right next door to the ruins of the film school it, it went out of business about 15 years ago. And since then, uh, it's just been moldering, fall, falling into the ground. It's really kind of sad. But anyway, I have revived that dream from all those years ago when I came back here. And unfortunately, a lot of the elders that I would have filmed with back then are gone. So there are fewer people to film with today. So the basic idea is to try and find the eldest who knows how to do something who still knows how to do it and still knows how to show how to do it. Because the great thing about video is that it's not just a form of oral history, it's a way to show and record how something was done. So that if down the road, hundred years from now, somebody wants to rehabilitate that skill, they can look at that video, they can get clues and they can see how it's done and do it again. That's the whole idea of the Wisdom Archive. It's, it's kind of like recognizing that uh, the loss of traditional culture is, you know, in my mind, as critical as the loss of biodiversity that's happening. There's just, we're becoming this monocultural thing, kind of pushed through the internet, pushed through television. And as all the richness of our culture falls away, I think we're poor for it. So the main focus that we've done, and right now we have uh, 41 films from Northern New Mexico that we've done since 2014. 
And they range from actually the most popular film that has the most views is a six minute film of uh, Trinidad uh, Manzanares, who is Antonio Manzanares. Antonio Manzanares in Mali, you'll see in the video I'm gonna show, I did an hour, uh, a 40 minute film about a year in the life of traditional sh shepherds in New Mexico. It's called The Last Shepherds. And his mother agreed to be filmed uh, showing her recipe for uh, biscochitos at Christmas. And so that's the one that brings more people to the website than <laughs> You know, her little six, and she's, she's incredibly charming. She's wonderful. And her cookies are fantastic. But so that kind of put us in a direction of doing a bunch of how-tos of cooking. So we have, a, I think we have about maybe seven now of different recipes and uh, also how to make a ristra. Um, so those are the kind of traditional, oh, and herbs. Uh, Camila Trujillo is a, a traditional herbera. And so I followed her on herb walks in the uh, collecting herbs in the native New Mexican uh, countryside in the spring and the fall, and then taking those herbs and putting them together and making muscle balm to put on her boyfriend's back, um, which is in one of these films as well. So there's, there's uh, traditional cooking, there's traditional herbs, and then uh, there's a, a lot of traditional music. Um, I was lucky to get connected with Cipriano Vigil and film with him, and one of the first things I did was I got him together with Antonia Apodaca and they were like the two eldest uh, practitioners of traditional Northern New Mexico music. And they knew each other. They're about a generation apart. They have never, never played together. So I got them together and they jammed and taught each other songs. And there's a 40 minute film of them that is just incredibly precious. And now Antonia has gone, right? So that's, that's when you really see the value of the wisdom archive as people pass and we have this record of them, um, it becomes even more valuable. And that's why in a way it's, it's, it's critical and it was very critical during COVID when I couldn't film with anybody. Uh, and so many people died, especially elders uh, and especially people in uh, Native American communities. Uh, a lot of the elders with wisdom in Native American communities passed. And, to date, we have done very little filming in Native American communities, mostly because a lot of their traditional knowledge is considered sacred and they don't necessarily want to share it. Uh, so the new direction that we're kind of heading is to train, uh, find young filmmakers from those communities and to train them uh, to make films to preserve culture with their elders in their own community. That would be their own internal archive and the first project is actually to train them to make a film of something that's not so sacred for the wisdom archive. So they learn how to do it. And that would be mentored by my, by my good friend and great filmmaker, Chris Beaver right here. Um, so they will, they'll get a grant, we'll choose them. They get a $2,500 grant to make a film and they, they get mentored for a year while they make that film that goes onto the wisdom archive. And then they're prepared and, and trained to go back into their community and film with their own elders and, and create their own wisdom archives in their community. Um, so the, the music, there was Cipriano, there's Antonia, and then there's a lot of traditional music of Northern New Mexico that um, there's different practitioners, but the ones that go the furthest back are called the entregas. And so there's a, entrega is a song that was sung in the little pueblos up here in the mountains before the, the times when there were churches in these little towns, there would be like one priest in Santa Fe who would visit these towns once a year. And so if somebody wanted to get married or they had a child or somebody died and there was no priest, there was no church, how did they celebrate that and make it somehow in the eyes of God? And that was for, for baptism uh, and for marriage, it was done by the musician in the village who would sing this entrega to the participants and to the community around them to bind them, to make obvious to the community that this binding was happening and to make the, the people in the community supportive of that, either the child who's being born or the couple who are being married. And usually when someone died, it was the role of the uh, penitentes from the Morada 
they would sing uh, Entrega del Defunto, which is the Entrega that they used for the death. And then once a year when the priest came, he would remarry people, he would rebaptize people, and he would do another ceremony for death. But this was a way of kind of protecting against, oh my God, if this child dies before the priest comes and he's not baptized, or if the town doesn't think we're really married, it was a way using music, using a traditional music that addressed the members of the community to make a social contract before the actual institutional contract that was done through the church. So there's three of those, and those are, all of them right now are actually in an exhibit uh, called Musica Buena, which is at the uh, Museum of International Folk Art. We, in a collaboration with them, we did about 12 films about different kinds of traditional music. And that is still on, it, you can still see it. And that, that includes um, Las Posadas. So we did one on Las Posadas in a small town in Ojo Caliente. We did Las Posadas on the plaza here in Santa Fe. And there's also the thing that's done on New Year's Day called Dar los Dias, which is where people would go from early in the morning from house to house singing in the new year. And we, we followed one of those, we filmed that. And the other one which happens, which you'll see a little bit of here, uh, is the, the Comanche version. And the Comanches uh, in Ranchos de Taos, there was a community, a, a band of Comanches who settled there and then intermarried with the Hispanic uh, people in that area and also with other people who had been enslaved. There was a lot of slavery in Northern New Mexico back in the 1700s, 1800s, mostly due to captives. People would get raided by a different tribe uh, or a tribe would raid the Spanish and they would often take the young girls and the women and take them away. And then once or twice a year, once in uh, ranchos and once in Abiquiu, those were the two Henistero communities. Henistero communities are mixed blood communities. Mixed blood coming from that those captives who then often came back pregnant. And it was actually possible to buy back your sister or your daughter at these bonanzas that happened once a year, once in, in uh, Abiquiu and once in uh, Ranchos, where they would have basically a big, kind of like a flea market of people and they would sell people who they had captured. Um, so the Comanches who are in that community now, once a year on New Year's Day, they go around the community and they bring in the new year by singing and dancing traditional Native American dances at the home of anyone who's named Manuel or Manuela. And for Northern Mexico, you don't find people whose name is Jesus, like in Mexico. Uh, here it's Manuel, Emmanuel. That is the, the, the name that refers to Jesus. So they would dance on New Year's Day at the homes of people who are Manuel or Manuela. So the, the film that we'll see in a little bit is basically has three short pieces out of three of the films. And one of the film is that, the Comanches. One is about a traditional farmer in uh, Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz, I don't know if you know, it's the little community next to Espanol. It was the first place where Spanish settled in, in New Mexico before they moved to Santa Fe, 12 years before they came here. 1580, they settled there right on the other bank, uh, other side of the river from uh, what the Spanish called San Juan uh, Pueblo and today's Okeo Um, So that was the first time that the Spanish settled there and that community was the first that had a sequias. So this guy Don Bustos still lives on the same land that's been in his family for 400 years, still uses the same acequia, the same blue corn seeds that they got from the Native Americans, the same chili seeds that they brought with them, um, and still plants it and still sells it at the farmer's market here in Santa Fe. Uh, and then the third piece in that is The Last Shepherds that I mentioned earlier, which is uh, Antonio and Molly Manzanares, who have the last big herd of big flock of sheep in northern New Mexico, in probably mostly in New Mexico in terms of the size, 900 ewes, which means that every year when they have lambs, they have anywhere from 900 to, it's one to two lambs usually. So it's probably somewhere around 1,200 to 1,500 lambs that they then sell for meat 
and the wool they use for weaving and they dye and they sell the yarn. If you've ever been up to Los Ojos to Tierra Wools, that's part of their operation. So they have Tierra Wools and then at the farmer's market, Shepherd's Lamb, that's where they shall sell, sell the lamb. And so they are the last ones who have the right from the forest service to take their sheep up onto the mountain, up into the sangres in the summer for four months only, and then bring them back down. So they graze way up high in the summer. And then they bring them back down on 64, back through Tierra Amarilla to Los Ojos and back onto the land. It's incredibly beautiful. And that's, you'll see some of that in the film too. So there's been uh, four longer films. Two of them are Year in the Life of the Traditional New Mexican Farm and the Shepherds. There's uh, the 40 minute film with Cipriano and Antonia. And then there's a 40 minute film about Cipriano himself and his life and, and the way he spreads his music. And then there's quite a bit, of, uh, uh, there's quite a few on traditional arts of New Mexico. I, the first film I made when I came was with my, the aunt of my neighbors across the street on Upper Canyon, uh, Monica Sosaya, who was like the grand dame of Spanish market. She was the eldest artist. She'd been doing it for the longest time. And she paints uh, matachinas on high. Matachinas are the traditional dance that's done in Hispanic communities, in Henisro communities, and in Native American communities. And it was brought here with the Spanish and it came to the Spanish with the Moors coming across from uh, North Africa. So it has an incredible long history. And there's two pieces in the Wisdom Marcado about the Matachinas. Um, and, uh, and so Monica paints those and she also does colcha, which is the traditional form of needlework that women would use back then with a very simple woven cotton cloth to make bedspreads and curtains and, and things like that. So, uh, and then there's Rita Padilla Hoffman. She's a weaver and she gets the churro wool and she uh, cards it, spins it, dyes it, and then weaves with it. She does the whole deal. So there's a film about her. And there's a film about uh, a really incredible, famous Santero, Nicholas Herrera, up in El Rito, which was done by Chris, uh, which is beautiful. Also him talking about his connection with the land and the Asapias. Uh, and then there's, uh, Diana Luhan, who lives here in Santa Fe, who is an incredible artist in straw applique. And so she, I follow her through the whole process of doing uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe in straw applique in tiny, tiny, tiny little pieces. And then there's uh, Juanito Jimenez. We went up to, uh, to Abiquiu and he goes out. I know when you go to Ghost Ranch, you go past that area where there's like the white and purple hills. He goes in there and he, that's where he collects his pigments. And then he takes them home and he mixes them with, uh, I mean, he, sh he shows how to do it in the film, but he basically uses uh, Castile soap. You, you take it, you grind it up, you mix it with Castile soap and that's the binder. And then he paints his Santos with that, with that paint. So there's a broad range of stuff that we've covered already. Um, there's a lot more that we could, although people are passing all the time. Uh, and uh, there's at the moment, there's really only myself. Chris has made some films. And there's one other filmmaker here in Santa Fe, Lucia Duncan, who made about six of the films that are uh, at the museum. Uh, and she did more of kind of like the the more modern version, so like Lone Pignon. I don't know if you have seen them perform. They do a lot of traditional music, but they're younger people who learned it from their elders. Um, so this is, this is our project. Um, we're shifting gears to some degree. Um, we recognize that we are elder uh, elders ourselves and we're Anglo. And so we are making films in societies that we are outsiders. Uh, and to some degree, it would be wonderful, it would be fantastic if people from those communities could be making films with their elders themselves. They wouldn't have any issues of, of uh, you know, trust, which sometimes we have to deal with. There's been a lot of uh, abuse, especially in the Native American communities, of their images. And for that reason, um, that's why we're starting to move this new project to this direction of training young people to film for the Wisdom Archive and for their own archives. 
So I'm happy to talk more about this and answer questions, but why don't we watch the, the film and then you'll get a little more. dance honoring the combatants. The reason it's named is Pantao is because the dancers are to act like if they're scared of each other. Tino and Minnie, it's a girl and a guy. When they dance that dance, they dance from the heart. Oh, and that's a beautiful performance that those kids do. Some of our dancers, they come from distant places. Some come from California, some come from Las Cruces, Albuquerque, from all over, that have started when they were young, and it has been part of their life, so they set aside that day to be here. It's an empty day without a drum beat in our valley so warming on New Year's Day. Even though it may be snowing or it may be very cold outside, but the drums, in my opinion, they warm up the hearts of many people in our community. And uh, I am one of those recipients, and I have been since I was a child. So it just resonates uh, beautiful memories of when I was a kid. And, and, uh, that's, that's what we do on New Year's Day. This is the old grinder we've been using for years. This is Camila's grandpa, kiddo. Grandma's, yeah. And grandma's. Yeah, we're still using it. It still, still works really, really well. That was a red chili that I grinded up before, so I, we use a grinder for everything. The first thing you do is harvest the blue corn, and we roast it on the oven to get that really nice smoky flavor. Hey, good morning, Emilio. What's happening, mijito? Huh? You doing good? Is it? Yeah. Good. Mm, what's nice is you got the chili mixed in. I know, it's going to be a killer blend, man. It's, it's going to be really, really nice. It's a pretty color. It's nice to get started like this. And I remember Grandpa Bustos, and he'd get up, he'd have a little fire going. Grandma had a tea, a little atole for him. Yeah, this is my favorite part of the day. Salud. Salud. Thanks, sweetie. Thanks. Dawn's special blend. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's hot. Yeah. Mm, came out perfect. <laughs> Flame throwing, a toilet. Mm, no, man, it's just right. 
Thank you. We'll see you guys. See you, John. Bye, Emilio. Take care. Okay. Yo sigo trabajando para mantener a lo que quiero tanto. I tell you, man, we're walking the same steps our ancestors walked 400 years ago, you know. The curves, the same depth, everything's the same. It is so freaking awesome, huh? Same land produces food for 400 years, sustained our family and families in the community. It's, it's like, this is the just and right thing people should be doing. Not everybody's lifestyle, but people that choose it should be allowed to, to live it to its fullest. Oh, no, this is cool. That's a piece of land that my ancestors farmed, huh? I can imagine them just doing the same thing you and I are doing. The same, same thing. That is so freaking cool, huh? I think was might have been the first year that we took him out to the forest because that was when our oldest son was I was expecting him and we've been doing it I guess for about 32 years is how long we've been coming back and forth it's just who I am yeah even when the weather's bad and it's even when it's bad it's good that's right it brings back a lot of memories of the what we used to do, bringing the cattle down and gathering in the fall. I have a book called Tough by Nature. It's written by some lady that spent 19 years um, interviewing women, ranch women, and drawing sketches and paintings of them and just a short interview. And there's one lady that said, if there's a woman that can pretty much do everything. It's because she had a dad that said, you can do whatever. And he didn't say, you're a girl, you can't do this. And that's us.
this day is a stressful one because of all the traffic and dealing with the public. And I don't know if you saw how many how many cars we had lined up behind us there on the highway, but people enjoy seeing it because they used to see it a long time ago, and, and then we're the only ones that they see now. So we're the last of the Mohicans. Ya no más nos acabamos nosotros y se acabó parece. You never know. Somebody will decide they want to do it. I hope. And if they don't, pues se acaba. This is todo. Oh, it makes me feel honored and proud in many ways, but it also makes me sad that it's going to be gone. Que más te puedo decir? Pretty much the whole, uh, we always try to avoid narration. We try to avoid putting ourselves in. It's not about us. We're just a filmmaker. It's about the person that we're filming. And what they have to say is what it's all about. Uh, nothing, and we don't really have much to add other than to make them as understandable and uh, attractive as we can. Uh, because sometimes, you know, none of these people are professional. They are all people who are not used to speaking to the camera. They're not used to being on camera. Uh, and that's who we focus on. We focus not on people who are famous or who are media hip, but on people who otherwise no one would ever see them again. And that's the whole point is, and sometimes people say, yeah, but you're filming people that nobody cares about, but that's the point, <laughs> that's the point. If we only film people who are famous or people knew about, then all these people who have all this knowledge, it would all go with them. So um, that's the background of, of what we're trying to do. And uh, anyway, any, any questions you have about what we're doing or questions for Chris about the, the mentoring and the film granting uh, program, we'd be happy to answer them. Yeah. How are you trying to solicit these younger indigenous people? Well, what we're trying to do right now is set up a program with IAIA, the Institute for American Indian Arts. So we're trying to find film students, not high school kids, kids who are already in college, who've shown some aptitude and some interest, uh, and then train them in a certain style of filmmaking. Uh, uh, a style of filming that, that we feel if you really want to preserve culture and knowledge, it's really about the person who's in front of the camera. And a lot of filmmaking today inevitably is more about the filmmaker than it is about the person on the camera. So uh, it's, it's a challenge, uh, you know, to find that. Um, uh, and we have our fingers crossed, you know. Um, um, I, have, I have spoken probably with 10, 20, maybe 20 different Native Americans about filming with them. And it always comes back to, well, I need to talk to the tribal council or whatever. And it's never happened. It's only happened in, with the Comanches who are mixed race, who are not, who actually are not claimed by either Hispanic or Native Americans as because they are mixed race. Uh, and then Chris did a beautiful film about actually the last speakers of uh, uh, a version of Yoka in the Central Valley in California. The last, uh, the mother who was the last native speaker and her daughter who she was teaching while they make baskets. That's also on the, the Wisdom Archive. So in their situation, it's very clear that there's not much time left for the culture of their tribe. And in New Mexico, and in the Southwest in general, many Native American tribes have pretty integral culture still. They still have elders and they still have this knowledge within it. So they're probably seen as less of a need, but as, as people pass, especially in the face of something like COVID, then you see the need more because sometimes we take our elders for granted. And we think, well, I'll find out, I'll get that story from them you know, next year when I visit them and then they're gone. So, um, Anyway, we'll see. We have our fingers crossed. Yeah. Do you mind uh, 
question or if you guys ask questions in here, if you could speak. Or sure. Happen, or okay. Uh, so that was the answer to the question of how are you, <laughs> how are you uh, finding these uh, young students to work with? I'm going to see if we have any online. Okay. Yes. Do you feel you've exhausted the field of traditional practitioners here in northern New Mexico? Uh, no. Uh, there are others. Um, not everybody wants to be filmed. Um, some people want to get paid. Um, we have no funding. This has all been... We, we have had some donations from family and friends. We have got no, no uh, institutional funding or state funding because uh, ironically, when you don't have an overhead, uh, you don't look like you're real, right? So even though we have 51 films that we've made and that we have on the, in the archive, we don't have a budget and we don't have an office and we don't have anything else. So we don't seem very fundable, even though we've made a lot of product. So yes, there are more people and it's starting to be a little bit easier because people see the films we've made and realize that we're honoring the people in the film. And then we start to get people coming to us and say, would you please like the, um, the film about the Comanches that happened because that guy, Francisco's daughter saw the film about Cipriano and said, would you please make a film about my dad before he passes because he's on oxygen and who knows how long he's gonna be around. That's how that happened. So that's starting to happen. I was wondering about the Taos area. Have you done much up there? Just really that film. Okay. That's the one. The Varelas are all descendants of the famous, the very unusual, idiosyncratic style woodworker discovered by Mabel Bachelhan, but now there are a dozen of them still working in that same style. So that, you know, just as I was watching and listening to certain people and certain experiences of mine popped into my head. Do you know any of them personally? We always try to do it by personal reference. It wouldn't be difficult. I've chatted with them. Well, if you would grab one of my cards and if there's a way of making a, a connection. The other thing, so I think most of you who are interested are on the list to taste mezcal. So the the relationship is that the other thing I do is I import I, I go to small traditional producers of mezcal in Mexico. Uh, usually people who aren't well known and who don't have a big operation and they're not uh, well funded. And I buy one to four uh, barrels, which in this case is a 220 liter food grade plastic drum. And I bring that here and in my garage in Upper Canyon, I take it out and I put it into the best oak barrels in the world and age it for anywhere from 18 months to five years. And it's, it's like the best Añejo mezcal in the world. There's not a lot of Añejo mezcal. Uh, so it's not maybe saying a lot, but it is really good. Uh, and then the profit from that, some of the profit from that goes to help fund the Wisdom Archive. So that's the connection why we're gonna go taste this. And if any of you are into mezcal and you want some of the best, and it's all collectors because each one of those comes out of a single barrel, there's only 250 bottles and when they're gone, it's over. So um, if, and I still have some of the three that are out there available if you'd like to buy it. And that's one way you can support uh, the Wisdom Archive. Yeah. Did you mention that some of the farmers go back to the community? itself in Mexico? Well, this is an interesting thing that's happening right now. Um, the original plan was that 50% of profit, 50% would go back to sociocultural organizations in the village of the Mescalero. 50% would go to the Wisdom Market. What's happening right now, Shirley, is that this has to go through the Mescalero and the Mescaleros probably partly because of their own economic thing, are deciding that maybe the money should go to them and not to the community. And it's become fraught. And so the idea that it's easy to give away money is, it is not easy. It's becoming, you know, whether it's with these young film students, uh, finding a way to get them a grant and to train them or giving money to the community. Uh, because the whole project in, in uh, San Cristobal, which this is a, a village that was, uh, that is 100% Zapotec. 
The, the number three that you'll taste out here was made by Edgar Gonzalez. He's a Zapotec Indian from this community. And up until NAFTA passed, it was about 2,200 happening, thriving village of corn farmers. NAFTA passed and all the cheap American corn came into the market. They lost their market. They went broke. And now 1,400 of those people live in the States doing manual labor, working in restaurants, whatever, to support their families back home, who at this point are elders and young single moms with kids. And the culture of the Zapotecs is very uh, rich, a lot of fiestas, a lot of dancing, a lot of beautiful headdresses and embroidery. And it's all based around uh, um, brass band music for some strange reason that I haven't, in, it's a, a convoluted story, but anyway, uh, so in their village, almost all the musicians are gone. They're working in the States. So their culture is threatened of disappearing because they no longer have the music and they don't have the money to hire a band from another town. So there's two elders in the town who are trying to train a children's band of uh, 37 to 14 year olds. And I pledged, we pledged, the, uh, the uh, Doña Tulis Mezcal pledged to give them $5,000 to buy instruments because they don't have instruments. And that's what we're talking about is that that you, it go, the idea came from the mescalero, but now the mescalero is not letting the money get to the people. So it's complicated. <laughs> but uh, any more questions or should we go? Yes. How many of, of your films focus on Santeros? Uh, let me see. Uh, well, there's the one that Chris did about Nicolas Herrera. And there's uh, the one with um, Juanito uh, Jimenez, who's showing how he collects the paints to paint. And then uh, Monica Sosaya, who's also a Santa. So three. And I'm, I have one that I'm hopefully going to do in the next month, which is with a tin worker, an elder woman tin worker, and her grandson teaching her grandson. And that's something else we always try to include if we can, is get the person we're filming with to teach someone within the film. Um, so they're not teaching us, they're teaching somebody. And that's the process where it gets passed. Question? Yeah, Scott, are there any skills, trades that you haven't filmed yet that you want to? Uh, well, you know, the, the um, the one that I'm going to do now, we haven't done anything with a uh, tin worker. Yeah. Uh, and I just did one with a straw applique. Um, and again, these are these people are like fourth generation. The people who really started this and were incredible, they've already gone. So these are like their grandkids or whoever. Um, there are things out there that I'm sure I don't know about. Um, and there's a lot of recipes and there's a lot, there's a lot, it's a rich culture. And definitely within the Native American community, there's a ton of stuff. Um, but it's probably not something that I can film or that Chris can film. Um, so that really needs to be done in a different way. Um, so as far as, you know, this is probably the most traditional area in the United States left. And that's why it's a, it's a good, out of the 51 films, 10 films are elsewhere. Four films are in Mexico, two films are in Colombia, one is in Brazil, one is in France, um, anyway, so like the, the three bottles that are out there, there's a film about the person who made each one of those bottles on the Wisdom Archive. So the first one is the Zapotec Indian, it's Mezcal. The second one is Raicia, and the third is Bacanora. So I make a film about each producer to promote them, promote their brand, promote their village. And those are also on the Wisdom Archive. <clears throat> yeah, sure. And not to prolong this, but I have a quick question. The sheep herders, uh, what is happening with their with forest fires? I mean, is it, they think they're from Mora around there, right? <laughs> no, they're from uh, Tierra Amarilla. Oh, so oh, they're way the other side. Yeah. yeah, they're, you know, up by Chama, yeah. which so far, no issue. And in the summer, they're, they're up um, not near the fires on the Sangre at the moment, luckily. 
Their biggest risk right now is kind of, as you see at the end of the movie, they have four children and they were a, a Hispanic family whose biggest value was education. And so they have a lawyer, they have a vet, another becoming a vet, uh, and somebody else who was in the service who is now becoming uh, a uh, organic pig farmer, but not here. So all four kids are gone. Well, but the vets can come back, obviously. <laughs> At the moment, it's not happening, and they are tired. Uh, Antonio and Molly are tired. They would love someone to come and help them and take take it over. And it's yeah. it's not happening. Yeah. So. Mescal? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys online for joining us today.